What we're doing here with our DVD production is to record part of the story related to the First World War. The most important part of all of this is to talk about the story of the 61 men, for instance, who had gone to the First World War and their experience in the very hardships. But what they've gone from is a rural town, a country town, a town where everybody knew everybody else. And it was just so then they were so isolated in their different places where they actually had to operate in trenches. They saw incredible cruelty and the deaths of many of their mates. So what we want to achieve with all of this is to leave a legacy of the history of the Keelor region again, specifically related to the Anzac memory. In Australia, the outbreak of World War I in 1914 was greeted with considerable enthusiasm, just as there had been a show of support for the Empire in the previously escalating conflict between the British Empire and the Boer Republics of Southern Africa, that is the Boer War of 1899 to 1902. In the governments of the self-governing British colonies of Canada, New Zealand, Cape Colony and the six Australian colonies all offered men to participate in that conflict. The Australian contingent numbered over 16,000 people. Even before Britain declared war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914, the nation pledged its same support alongside other states of the British Empire and almost immediately began preparations to send forces overseas to participate in the conflict. The first World War I campaign that Australians were involved in was in German New Guinea after a hastily raised force known as the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force was dispatched from Australia to seize German possessions in the Pacific in September 1914. At the same time, another expeditionary force initially consisting of 20,000 men and known as the First Australian Imperial Force, AIF, was raised for service overseas. The AIF departed Australia in November 1914 and after several delays due to the presence of German naval vessels in the Indian Ocean, arrived in Egypt where they were initially used to defend the Suez Canal. In early 1915, however, it was decided to carry out an amphibious landing on the Gallipoli Peninsula with the goal of opening up a second front and securing the passage of the Dardanelles. The Australians and New Zealanders grouped together as the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, ANZAC, went ashore on the 25th of April 1915 and for the next eight months, the Anzacs alongside their British, French and other allies fought a costly and ultimately unsuccessful campaign against the Turks. I had three uncles in that, for, in that uh, area. The Commonwealth Government pledged Australia's wholehearted support to Great Britain in the words of the opposition leader, Andrew Fisher, who became Prime Minister one month after the war started, Australians will stand beside our own to help and defend her, the mother country, and to our last man and our last shilling. Most Australians greeted the news with great enthusiasm and the volunteers rushed to enlist an exciting war which would expect it to be over by Christmas. Thousands of men swamped the recruiting officers on the day they opened. Some sought combat. Others escaped from the normal life. Some needed regular pay, while others would have enlisted just for nothing. In response to the overwhelming number of volunteers, the authorities set exacting physical standards for the recruits. I'm a descendant of, uh, of David and Susan Milburn, the first, uh, uh, one of the first residents of Keeler. And, uh, my memories of uh, their son Alf was that uh, uh, he was a very mechanical minded man. Uh, I think in his younger days he was very uh, much into motorcycles, hill climbing and uh, that sort of stuff on motorbikes. Uh, 
Melbourne's had a big steam engine at the time for pumping water. That was his, one of his main things, working on the steam engine. Yeah, very much into uh, mechanical things. Uh, after the Second World War, he introduced a, uh, a reversible disc plough that was converted from a horse-drawn plough, converted to be drawn behind a tractor. And it was his uh, uh, ingenuity, I think, that uh, got this all together. And also he pioneered the uh, introduction of tractors into Keeler. Well, with the, uh, there is a letter that he had written fr from France in, I think, 1916 to his father, 10 pages, uh, outlining a lot of the activities that they were involved in over in France. And uh, he was uh, a runner, sending out messages to, and delivering and sending out messages to the front line. And uh, this is, uh, how he was uh, recommended by his uh, peers for an uh, honour um, and uh, that's, I believe, how the medal uh, came about. I don't know whether I should say this, but uh, <laughs> during his time he, he was court-martialed, uh -huh. so he used, to, he used to like to tell me that and bring out the, the necessary paperwork, but when my aunt gave me all the medals and the paperwork she had, because when he did this, she used to go really off that he should have been ashamed of himself. He told me it was for selling dirty petrol to the Yanks. Yeah. And somehow, I think after he died, that court martial must have disappeared. I think she destroyed it. Yeah. So he, he talked more about that than he did about the medal, really. Okay. The United Kingdom declared war on Germany the next day and on 8th of August, the Australian government received a reply requesting that the transfer be made immediately if not already done. Two days later, on 10th of August, the Governor-General officially transferred control of the Royal Australian Navy to the British Admiralty which would retain control until August the 19th, 1919. Tom enlisted from Keelor into the Australian uh, Infantry Force in 1916 and he left on the Orsova for overseas on the 1st of August. In one of his early letters, he writes about the food on the ship and the breakfasts were either a chop, a piece of steak or a sausage with porridge as well. And for dinner, he said they had roast beef, potatoes, cabbage and plum pudding for dessert. And quoting him, he says, so we don't do too bad, do we? I don't know that I'd like that diet for three weeks. Tom saw his first snow in France and one Sunday they'd had lots of snow but they had to march five miles to church through the snow. Only the day before they had marched exactly the same distance to have a bath. It was the first time they'd had a bath in a month. And in his letter he says, so you can guess the colour I was. Another letter he writes about being in the trenches and how bad the rats were. But the rats were so bad that they were eating holes in their boots and their hats while they were sleeping in their dugouts. So the soldiers decided they had to get rid of some of these rats and Tom says how they smoked them out of their holes and had sticks and had great fun killing them. It created a little bit of sport. At least it may have reduced their number a little. In April 1917, Tom's battalion was being hard pressed at Villers Bretonneur and a friend who wrote to let the family know who'd been there when it happened, one of the machine guns had been put out of action, the crew had been put out of action. Tom, Tom tried to get to the machine gun to get it working again, but unfortunately a few paces from the gun, a sniper's bullet 
killed him. He is buried in the Adelaide Cemetery at Villers-Bretonneux. He was just 21.